I wonder how many of you remember what it was like to be new at something, you know? I remember the feeling of being new in school and feeling like you didn't know anybody else, wondering if you'd make some friends and what the experience would be like. I remember being new to a sport. I was always terrible at sports, so I knew it wasn't going to go well in most cases. I remember being new at an instrument, you know, and, and feeling like I was just never going to figure out how to play this thing and having the shrieks of the guitar strings and the, you know, my poor parents who had to sit there while I figured it out. Thank God my parents didn't have to deal with me learning to play drums growing up or something like that. Um, I remember what it was like to be new to college and settling into the four-year dorm experience. I was blessed to be able to experience that and all the excitement of meeting new people and, and, and the rush of getting to know everybody there. I remember what it was like to be new in a relationship and I'm all Twitter pated and thinking that the whole world was ahead of you. I remember the feeling of being newly engaged. I remember the feeling of being newly married, conquering the world together. Oh boy, I remember the feeling of being a new parent. That is one that of all the things I forget in my life will never, it is seared into my brain for all time. Months of grueling sleeplessness, but also anticipation of knowing that God has entrusted you with this child, that it's your job now to steward them uh, to become whoever God wants them to be. I remember being new to sending our kids to school and taking that picture with, you know, first day of whatever grade. Every single year it hits different, like the first time all over again. Some of you know what it's like to be newly empty nesters and to have your house to yourself again. Um, I wonder how many of you remember what it was like to be new to your faith in Jesus. I do. I remember worship feeling electrifying. I would like be praying during the worship time and literally have visions of like lightning bolts on stage and just feeling the power of God in the room as believers gathered together and sang. I remember the preacher standing up in the front. I didn't know him from anybody, but I felt like I was the only one in the room and I felt like he was speaking right to me. I wonder how many of you remember that I remember being new to the Bible and cracking it open and, you know, kind of figuring out what this is about and the blood and the guts of the Old Testament and getting through that and going, man, what's this thing all about? How do I understand God's will for my life? As I grew in my new faith, I became increasingly aware of my sin because that's what happens when you're new in your faith. But as you grow in your faith and become aware in your sin, I also became increasingly aware of the grace of God and his mercy over my life. I wonder how many of you remember what it was like to be new to a church? Some of you are like, remember, I'm there right now, bro. (laughs) I'm trying to figure it out today. And It's an exciting experience, you know? It's like, where are gonna fit in? Where's my place? And, you know, are there gonna be people that are like me that that I can connect with? I wonder wonder how many of you remember what it's like to be new in a small group and you're in a circle of people you don't know, you've never been with, and there's that little awkward silence that is just pervasive throughout the entire gathering. But somehow, over the course of a four to six week journey, that awkward silence transitions into some laughter here and there. And that laughter, Laughter begins to break out into honest sharing that starts to happen and prayer that happens as folks open up from their lives. I remember, I wonder how many of you remember what it was like to be new to serving and feeling like, goodness gracious, what are they giving me this remote for? I don't know what I'm doing. And none of us here do, but somehow we keep clicking buttons and Jesus keeps working and the Holy Spirit just continues to move in our midst. I remember what it was like to be newly planting a church. You know, there's a lot of things about planting a church that I don't miss. I don't miss the setting up and the tearing down early in the morning. And um, somebody knows this very well who was our truck driver for many a years. Um, I, I don't miss the gross stuff that we had to clean up uh, on a weekly basis to kind of make things appropriate for children's ministry and having church in an environment. Uh, but, you know, I will tell you what I do miss often 
is that feeling of taking new territory for Christ and that excitement about what God wanted to do through a small group of people with no idea of what was ahead in the future except that the Lord had put a task in front of us. Um, You know, the longer that I've been a Christian, the easier it becomes to forget what it was like to be new. And the longer I've been doing ministry, the easier it is to forget the passion for Christ that was once so obvious and so evident in this young 25-year-old who slept eight hours a night. Um, The longer I'm in ministry, the harder it seems to be sometimes to find that willingness to sacrifice and go that extra mile uh, at that certain time of the day when I don't feel like it uh, because of the busyness of life. And yet the longer we've been doing anything of value, whatever it is, the more important it becomes to remind ourselves of what it was like to be new. You know, in Revelation, Jesus told a super solid church. They had great theology. They were leading people to Christ. And um, even they were suffering for, for Christ as Christians. And so they were really doing everything right in their time. But Jesus looks at this church and he writes to them in Revelation chapter two. And he says, I have this against you. You've lost your first love. And so his uh, remedy to them was a reminder of what it was like to be new. And he said, if you want to gain that back, he says, go back and do the things that you did in the beginning and you will see your heart restored. So I want to encourage you now to remind yourself and put yourself in the mindset of what it's like to be new. Open your life orientation manual uh, to uh, the book of Acts chapter 13. Uh, Play along with me. You are brand new to Jesus. You are brand new to this church. Put yourself in that state of mind. My message title today is, Welcome to the Ministry. You are now part of the ministry here. And today what we're going to see as you turn and swipe to the book of Acts chapter 13. By the way, if you didn't bring a Bible with you, download the YouVersion app. Uh, You can find the book of Acts there. I read from the English Standard Version as you turn and swipe there. Uh, We're going to see God start using the new guy. And the new guy, a.k.a. was Saul, who is about to be given a new name, Paul. The reality is Paul wasn't really new. He had actually been around and been a Christian for nine years. And he had done some preaching in Damascus early on in ministry. But then the Lord led him into a season of what I would call blessed obscurity for a season of life before this recorded era of ministry. I wonder if, how many of you have ever felt like you were in a season of blessed obscurity? Uh, you're not alone. Paul was there a good six years of his life before he becomes the apostle Paul. He was a nobody. He was serving Jesus and learning and growing. Um, and the rest of Acts, what we're gonna see now is it shifts the focus away from Peter's ministry, that's the first 12 chapters, to the apostle Paul's ministry in chapters 13 through 28. And we're going to see God do a new thing. And God was about to use the new guy to take the gospel to the nation. So we're going to cover a lot of territory today. Two full stories. I'm not going to read all of it, but a good chunk of it. Before we get into God's word together, would you bow your head and your heart with me? Lord, thank you for the reminder in your word of what it was to be new. To remind ourselves of the things early on in our faith that we did, Lord, that just catapulted our faith through the power of the Holy Spirit to where you have us today. Uh, Keep that reminder in our minds front and center of what it is to be new. Open our eyes to see what you want us to see from your word. Open our ears to hear what you want us to hear from it. And open our hearts that we would respond today and become the disciples you want us to be as a result of having read it and worshiped together in your name. Amen. I'm just going to read 13, 1 through 3. Now there were in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Menaean, a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshiping, the, while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work 
to which I have called them. Then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and they sent them off. So I'll pause right there. You know, here we see this brand new ministry team being commissioned, uh, being prayed for, and then being sent out into the work of ministry. I wonder how many of you in the last few weeks remember the church of Antioch. I talked about it a little bit ago. It was this great church that two men from Cyprus and Cyrene who weren't formally commissioned in any capacity, but they just started preaching the gospel to the Gentiles in Antioch and people started getting saved and the Jerusalem church hears about it. It's so good that they send Barnabas down to check it out. Barnabas encourages everybody. He's stoked on what's happening. Well, now we're coming back to this church in Antioch here and we're seeing that this church in Antioch is really healthy and they're so healthy that they are actually sending out leaders into the mission field. You see the fruit of the labor that had happened earlier and so this commissioning happened during a prayer service. You know we don't naturally wake up wanting to sacrifice and serve and love others. Uh, You know, we wake up thinking about ourselves and our needs, but through prayer, God opens us uh, to be willing to sacrifice and serve Jesus faithfully where we are and even under the ends of the earth. Now, this commissioning that happened here was not hasty. It was not short-sighted. There's a verse in 1 Timothy 5.22 where the Apostle Paul talks about in ministry. He says, don't be hasty with the laying on of hands. And what he means by that is when you're bringing up a new leader, make sure they're ready for what you're bringing them on to do. Uh, Because the worst thing any of us can go through is to be put into a place that isn't right for us. And so this commissioning here was not hasty whatsoever. Paul had been around for nine years. He was ready for this moment. And this amazing church really just recognized what the Holy Spirit was already doing in Paul. They prayed for him, they commissioned him, and they sent them out. Friends, the goal goal of every growing and healthy church is to commission people into ministry. That's the goal. And really, if you think about that, everything that we do in our lives is actually ministry. So it's not just what happens when you're here at City Church. This is one and a half percent of your ministry week. Your ministry is your whole life. I often say, you know, if you don't think you have a ministry, walk out your front door. (laughs) You have a ministry. In your home, you have a ministry. And so I hope that you're not coming here just to get a good feeling to get you through your week because that is gonna wind up empty and short so fast and it's the hallmark of religion. What I hope you are coming here for is to be empowered to go out into your mission field of your life, that you would be sent out into the fields of your life. And so our job here is to prepare you, to equip you with scripture and to send you out. So everyone is called to ministry and everything that we do is ministry, but some Christians are even called to the ministry globally, and that's what we see Paul specifically here. He was one of those Navy SEALs for Jesus, if you will, that just had a calling to the ends of the earth, and he went. And so this first missionary journey of Paul is about to start here in verses 4 through 12. We're going to see that it begins, they encounter opposition, and they experience their first win. You're going to see that pattern in the Apostle Paul's missionary journeys over over and over again. There's a preaching that happens, there's some kind of opposition, and there's some kind of win. Um, So now let's read the first story that happens in verses 4 through 12. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. When they had arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews, and they had John to assist them. When they had gone through the whole island as far as Paphos, uh, they came upon a certain Jewish magi- a certain magician, a Jewish false prophet named Bar Jesus. He was with the proconsul Sergius Paulus, a man of intelligence, who summoned Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. But Elymas the magician, for that is the meaning of his name, opposed them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. But Saul who was also called Paul. Here's the first place that he's called Paul. Um, Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him and said, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, full of deceit and villainy, will you not stop making crooked the straight paths of the Lord? And now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon you and you will be blind and unable to see for a time. Immediately mist and darkness fell upon him and he went about seeking to lead people, lead him, uh, lead, seeking people to lead him by the hand. Then the proconsul believed when he saw what had occurred for he was astonished at the teaching of the Lord. So a few just kind of things that uh, will begin 
begin to see a lot is they always start out preaching in the synagogue. And I love Paul and his companions' faithfulness to go to the Jewish people first. He knew in his heart they were going to reject the message. And every time it pre- he preaches, they pretty much do. But he always starts there faithfully to his own kin because remember, Paul was a Jew of Jews. So he would start there. He would go faithfully to the synagogue Um, So he preaches to the Jews and then he encounters opposition from someone who claims to be a Jew yet also is called a magician or a sorcerer. This was like a total oxymoron. It would be like saying Anaheim Angels and winning baseball team in the same (laughs) sentence. Goodness gracious, I don't even follow sports, but they're terrible. I mean, it's like, geez, man. I'm thinking about becoming a Dodgers fan and I don't even care, you know? Show hate, right? Anyway. (laughs) Jews were not supposed to engage in magic and sorcery and all that kind of stuff. But this guy practically added those services to his business card. It would be a little bit like this. Imagine if during our prayer time, which is our little prayer corner here, which by the way, I always encourage you to come up and get prayer. Imagine you come up and you're there to get prayer. And right after you go to get prayer, they pull out a pack of tarot cards and a Ouija board. (laughs) You would rightly rebuke us in the name of Jesus, cast something out and walk out those doors. Give us a negative review on Yelp. You know what I mean? Uh, But literally, that's basically what this guy did. I mean, that stuff is demonic. Everybody knew it. And yet he was just going around and peddling his influence. That's really what he was. He kind of reminds me today of people who would call themselves like a spiritual guru. Anybody have anybody like that on your Instagram feed or friend list? And like, what I often want to say is like, you know, Jesus is the spiritual guru. You, my friend, are a sinner like everyone else, okay? Uh, But I will pray for you in the name of Jesus, right? Um, So this guy was an influence peddler and he liked being important and he liked being close to people who were important. But what's the core here is that he was an opponent of the gospel because the gospel was a threat to his power. And he knew if this proconsul begins to believe in Jesus, he's going to stop listening to all the garbage that he was spreading. And God was working to reach this person who was very influential for the gospel. And this was huge, not just for the apostle uh, Paul but and this particular person, but for that whole region. He oversaw an entire region in the, uh, and he reported directly to the Roman Senate. You know, when influential people become Christians, it makes other people think about it. I don't think it's the end all be all of whether or not, you know, somebody becomes a Christian or not. And certainly we've all seen our fair share of influential people who claim to become Christians and turn and go the other way. But if we're honest, we've probably also seen a lot of our friends and family who were once claiming the name of Jesus and have gone and been in other ways. So I don't think that we should treat celebrities any different. We should pray for them. We should uh, ask God to use them for the gospel so that the gospel can be spread. Uh, but when God's working on someone influential, there's no denying that uh, more a gospel opportunity can open up. And so this opponent, Elymas, was try, trying to draw the proconsul away from the faith. It specifically says that in verse eight. It's a great question. How do you know when someone or something is bad? Well, a great answer is when they are trying to draw you away from the faith. Whether it's a thing or whether it's a person, if it is trying to draw you away from the faith, it is not good for your soul. And so Paul confronts this guy and he strikes him with blindness. But I also want to take note that the Bible talks about how he struck him with blindness and how he confronted him. It says that he confronted him while he was full of the Holy Spirit. Here's an encouragement for all of us. Never confront anyone until you are absolutely confident that you are full of the Holy Spirit. And then wait two days. (laughs) See, Paul was able to be full of the Spirit and confront this person. And it wasn't about Paul. It wasn't even about this person. It was about the gospel. And he strikes him with blindness. And initially that seems like a punishment, but actually what Paul was doing was a touch of the grace of God. Because in the Jewish law, people that practiced sorcery and claimed to be priests were put to death. Now he wasn't a priest, but he was, you know, a Jewish person, all that. I mean, but 
it was punishable by death. And this guy would have known that. Um, and so Paul knew that this was a touch of grace in this person's life. It was an opportunity for him to rethink his life. Um, and it causes his, this miracle causes this proconsul here to actually become a believer. And it's worth noting that salvation is a result of many factors. You know, it's never just that prayer that someone prays. It's like God had been drawing them, their friend talked to them about it at work, you know, their mom was praying for them long before that their grandma was. Uh, there are always factors beyond our control or that are bigger, that are happening when people are coming to faith. But this event was the thing that flipped this proconsul over the edge, he becomes a Christian and it's a win for the gospel. And after this, the missions team sails on again and they go to Perga in Pamphylia. And I'm going to summarize most of this, but I'm going to read now verses uh, 13 through uh, 16 just to get us started. So it's the next trip. Now Paul and his companions set sail from Paphos and came to Perga in Pamphylia. And John left them and returned to Jerusalem. But they went on from Perga and came to Antioch in Pisidia. This is another Antioch. And on the Sabbath day, they went into the synagogue and sat down. So again, here's that custom. They go to the Jews and they talk in the synagogue first. And after reading from the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent a message to them saying, brothers, if you have any word of encouragement for the people, say it. So, so, so Paul stood up and motioning with his hand, he said, and he began to preach. I'm not going to uh, read his entire message, but the gist of those first few verses that I want to bring out before I summarize it is uh, they get to the synagogue again. Uh, they are encouraged to say something. Paul shares something. And one other little note that happens in there is that John Mark bails. This is like a blip reference here, but it's going to be a big deal that's going to come back later in the book of Acts that there was actually a divisive moment that happened here. Um, and so Paul and the crew, they show up, they preach, and uh, you got to appreciate his faithfulness again to continue to preach to the Jewish people, even though uh, it wasn't probably likely to go well. So to summarize kind of all of verses 16 through 41, Paul basically summarizes the entire Old Testament as best as he can or hits some of the highlights. And in doing so, he was showing the Jewish people in that synagogue that he knew his stuff and he understood what he was talking about. And he was getting to the point where he was basically saying all of the Old Testament culminates about Jesus, the Messiah. Um, and, and so then uh, everybody is intrigued. And now jump down with me to verse 42. It says, as they went out, so he had wrapped up his message, the people begged that these things might be told them the next Sabbath. So in other words, they're saying, please tell us more. Come back the next week. In verse 43, and after the meeting of the synagogue broke up, many Jews and devout converts to Judaism followed Paul and Barnabas, who, as they spoke to them, urged them to continue in the grace of God. So some people right then and right there seem to have given their life to the Lord. And uh, then what ensues next was pretty crazy the following week. Now jump down to verse 44. The next Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. But the Jews... But when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and they began to contradict what was spoken by Paul reviling him. And Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly saying, it was necessary that the word of God be spoken first to you since you thrust it aside and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life. Behold, we are turning to the Gentiles. For so the Lord has commanded us saying, I have made you a light for the Gentiles that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. And when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord. And as many as were appointed to eternal life believed. And the word Word of the Lord was spreading throughout the whole region, but the Jews incited the devout women of high standing and the leading men of the city stirred up to per, stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and drove them out of their district. But they shook off the dust from their feet against them and went to Iconium and the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. So here we see he got the crowd's attention. Almost the whole city turns up. Uh, the Jews are jealous. They stir up division against him. So Paul does what Paul does, which is once the Jews rejected him, he turns to the Gentiles. God does what God does, which is spreading the gospel uh, to others. Um, and and uh, the disciples just continuing, continued to do what disciples do, which is shaking off the 
haters moving forward and preaching the gospel with joy regardless of the circumstances. So we had two kind of different stories with a lot of little subplots and characters being woven in along the way. But now I want to like fast forward to 2,000 years later to you and me who are new to ministry and who are new to our ministry orientation session here. And I got some lessons from Paul that I want to share with you that are going to be relevant to you now as you are entering or re-entering the mission field of your life. When you came in today, you should have gotten a note sheet. It's one of the ways we follow along. The first thing that I would love for you to jot down if you wanna do that is this. Be sure to constantly remind yourself of who called you and why you're doing it. Most important thing in ministry once you step into the ministry of your life is to remind yourself constantly of who called you and why you're doing it. So in this text, we see this place where Paul is first called Paul. It's a name change from Saul. Uh, If you know the connotation with his prior name, he was the murderous of Christians, uh, Jewish person who uh, would go to the ends of the earth to stamp out the faith. And now we see his whole identity has been reshaped and reformed by Christ. And so what God did is he turned him into the most hardcore Christian ever. Um, and, and so one of the things that I love here is that God took a negative trait that was part of his personality when he was a Jewish person persecuting the faith and God uh, uses and redeems that trait for good. And that same Saul, Saul who would do anything to stop Christianity became Paul who would do anything to spread it. Our personalities probably won't change that much when we become Christians. You know, some people think that when you become a Christian, if you're an introvert, you're going to become an extrovert or something like that. Uh, I wish it worked that way, you know, or, or, you know, if you were bad at math, now you're going to be good at math, okay? Well, I think with Jesus, you know, he can help you work hard and you can become a little bit better with hard work. We can all improve certain things, but I don't really think that our core personality actually changes that much when we become a Christian. What God does is he takes the negative parts of our personality and he redeems them through the lens of our new identity and then suddenly he uses those things for his good because we see ourselves now through a new purpose. So how does God change our identity? Well, we were alienated from God and now through Christ, we're sons and daughters of God. We were dead in our trespasses and sins and now we are alive in Christ. We were bound and under a curse, scripture says, but our chains now have been broken and we're set free. We were messengers of the world and now we are messengers of the cross. We had no desire to obey God uh, because we thought that life was all about us and this earth was all that there was. And now we see the emptiness in self-gratification and we realize that life is all about the hope of Christ and the eternity that we're gonna share with him. I could go on and on and on about the identity reformation that happens when a person becomes a Christian, but the bottom line is God rocks your whole world. He changes your whole way of thinking from the inside out. And we don't want to go back because it's not just that we used to live differently. It's actually different. It's that that's not who we are anymore. By the grace of God, we have been made into a new person. Jesus says, all who come to him are a new creation. Um, And we need to remind ourselves constantly in life and in ministry of the identity shift that has happened. Um, And during the next 16 chapters in the book of Acts, you're gonna see Paul constantly in moments where he will remind himself uh, and those around him of the identity shift that has happened in him and in them. We need to do that too. You know, as a pastor, I constantly need to remind myself of who called me and why I'm doing what I'm doing. When the numbers in the ministry are up and to the right, I need to remind myself of who called me and why I'm doing what I'm doing. When things are flat and it's just an everyday experience in church, I need to remind myself of who called me and why I'm doing what I'm doing. When things aren't looking so good, Maybe there's less people coming. The numbers don't look great. I need to remind myself of who called me and why I'm doing what I'm doing. When opposition kicks in, I need to remind myself of who called me and why I'm doing what I'm doing. Here's where I take great comfort as a pastor. 
you know, if I ground my life identity in Christ, I'm gonna have a better chance of leading you in that example too. And if you ground your life identity in Christ, you're gonna have a better chance at leading the people in your world in that example as well. It's not about behavior change. It's about a fundamental shift of identity that's happened. And we need to constantly remind ourselves of who called us, how the Lord called us, and why we're doing what we're doing, which is spreading the gospel. Here's the second thing that we need to know in ministry, in our new uh, ministry orientation panel here. It won't always be easy, but the reward will be worth it. Ministry had some undeniably tough moments for Paul and for the crew. And a few of them to highlight right here, John Mark left. That's going to be a toughie that we're going to see come back. There was a Jewish opposition. He stirred up the men and the women from the city and the town uh, uh, against him. The, the, the Jews did. Uh, there was uh, an opportunity there for them to get downtrodden or an opportunity for them to shake the dust off their feet and to move on and continue to serve the Lord, which is what they did. But what was priceless and what I want to reread for you right now is verses 48 and 47. 48 says, and when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord. And as many of them, or as many as were appointed to eternal life believed, and the word of the Lord was spreading throughout the whole region. See, guys, that's what we live for as Christians. We live to see the word of the Lord spread in our region. Um, and, and, and so that's what Christians live for. This was absolutely priceless. Yes, there were tough moments, but the reward was worth it. Everyone and anyone who's been in ministry has battle scar stories to share. Even some of them from Christians, unfortunately. I'll share a few of mine. Uh, probably one of the first big ones was that the church that I really, really wanted to work at right after college. Uh, I applied to as many different roles as I could possibly see. And apparently I wasn't even qualified to janitor over there, I don't know. And they just said, I'm sorry, we don't think you're a fit for our team right now. And it had hurt. I mean, that was the place where I grew up in my faith. And now I had went off and I went to, to college and learned about the Bible. So my thought in my head was, I'm gonna come back and I'm gonna work there. That was my whole thought and my whole purpose in life. And I remember just feeling a little bit stunned and scarred and not sure where to turn. But now I look back and I thank God for that moment because if that hadn't happened, I wouldn't be here. I've equated that church back there where I still go for training and, and all kinds of stuff, but I equate it to the womb. <laughs> it was comfortable, it was cozy, but if I had gotten stuck over there, I would have never uncomfortably gone out and followed God into his calling for me. Um, as we were planting, uh, we were told that we could meet as a church within a church by our current church's leadership at the time. It was a public thing that I was planting a church and the church I was a part of at that time, uh, they said, you know, that's fine. You can use our facilities for a period of time until you kind of get your own and, and go on. Uh, and then about a month and a half or so, I'm looking at some people who were around during those times, a uh, month and a half or so beforehand, they pulled the rug out and said, sorry, kidding, you can't, you gotta go. And also, if you want to do this, you're going to have to leave your job. It was hard. It was painful. But now again, I look back and I thank God for that because I would have tried to stay in two different worlds that just wouldn't have been possible. Uh, you know, in ministry, you invest in people who take off and then they blame you for their problems. That always feels great. Uh, there are people who I thought were my closest friends that stabbed me in the back. Uh, we have team division sometimes that pops up and we got to stamp it out. I have been physically threatened on multiple occasions as a pastor. I won't go into the details of that. Um, some of the people who Lisa and I officiated their weddings have gone on to get a divorce. And that is so sad. Now, I went back and I did check. And according to my statistics, 95% of the couples who we have officiated their wedding, weddings for are still together. I think those are pretty good numbers. Especially when you consider the fact that OBs are about 80%. So I'm just saying, uh, you know, if you want someone to marry you and you got a better chance, you know. Uh, anyway, love you, OB. Uh, just had to throw it in there. Uh, my wife has endured health hardships. We've been through just unbelievable family things like I'm sure all of you have. The point is ministry can be really tough. It can be lonely. Um, I want to read you from 2 Corinthians 1. If you got a Bible, just, just leave a thumb in Acts and, and switch over there. Man, this is such a powerful verse 
to hold on to. I'll give you time to, to get over there, but 2 Corinthians 1, 8 through 11, this is Paul, the same Paul talking. Verse eight, he says, for we do not want you to be unaware, brothers, of the affliction we experienced in Asia, for we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. I wonder how many of you have been there in your life where you're just like, gosh, man, I, I don't even know what's happening in my life. This is so hard. And sometimes, you know, you feel like you're the only one. And I just want to remind all of us that we're not. It's part of the life's journey. But then he goes on and he says, verse nine, indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death, but that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. He delivered us from such a deadly peril and he will deliver us. On him, we have set our hope that he will deliver us again. You also must help us by prayer so that many will give thanks on our behalf for the blessing granted us through the prayers of many. So I love the vulnerability of Paul here who's like, you know, I just want you to know this is not going well. And not only is it not going well, y'all need to pray for me right now. And when you pray for me, he's like, you're gonna benefit as you see God deliver and bring this situation around. So the second thing everyone's gotta know in ministry, it's not always gonna be easy, but the reward is gonna be worth it. Um, I love James 1.12 that talks about remaining steadfast under trial and that when we have stood the test of our lives, that we, if we continue to follow the Lord, we will receive the crown of life that God promises to those who love him. Um, I love 2 Timothy 4, 7 and 8 where at the end of Paul's life, he says, I fought the fight, I finished the race. And he says, the crown of righteousness is now awaiting me from the Lord. So the reward is worth it. And it is a privilege to be used by Christ. We get to do this with joy. So be sure to constantly remind yourself uh, who called you and why you're doing it. It won't always be easy, but the reward will be worth it. Third thing I want you to jot down is when everyone plays their role on the team, it is amazing. That's the ride of the life of ministry that's so good. Um, you know, some of the best parts in this story, verse 12, where this super influential government dude becomes a, a Christian, and that's so cool. Verse 48, the Gentiles becoming Christians, the word of the Lord spreading in the region. Verse 51, the disciples pulling it together despite opposition, shaking the dust off their feet and moving on and keep on keeping on for Christ with joy. So just like ministry has some, you know, battle scar stories, ministry also has some of the best stories that you'll ever tell for your whole life. You know, I, I love thinking about the fact that this church started in a park, then went to a punk rock club uh, and into this gorgeous OG church building for Jesus. <laughs> where we got to live on the legacy of, of saints that had been praying uh, for the kingdom of God to continue to move forward in Anaheim for a long time. Prayers lined up and God continued to move. We've seen people get healed, babies be delivered from illnesses and cancers, miracle pregnancies, salvations, baptisms, people who met here and got married, marriages that were on the rocks that are now solidly built on the rock of Jesus Christ. Being a place where families can grow and flourish. Uh, being a place where lifelong friendships have been formed. Our best friends are all right here in this church. Um, being a church where the outreach of this church, man, it far exceeds and outpaces our size and scope of a church. It's not humanly explainable. Um, and so the point is when everyone in the church is playing their part, it's absolutely amazing. Um, how many of you like winning? Show of hands. Anybody like winning? Okay, good. That's good to know. I, I, I like to win too. A little sports analogy for you. Uh, this one came from Obi. Can't take credit for it. He does a little bit of research sometimes. So, hey, throw this in there. I thought this was pretty good. Two sports researchers found that winning also comes with a trap. It increases a team's dependence on star players, the study says. And they said this makes a team less adaptable and more likely to get stuck in old ways of doing things. And that then in turn increases the chance of failure the next time around. So this group of sports researchers researched 60,000 basketball games over 34 years and they came to this conclusion. We found that winning, uh, after winning, teams become more reliant on star players. They pass the ball about 6% more to the stars and they're 
shot distribution skewed 15% more toward the big performers. And he talked about how, you know, in a sense, doubling down on what made you win is natural. It's like, hey, we did that at work. Let's, let's do that again. Uh, but what happened is then that increased reliance on the star players made the teams more predictable to their next opponent and easier to defeat and less likely to win the game. Um, and so instead, what they recommend is to focus on the whole team of what God is doing and not just the star players because when the teams succeed, there's less credit given that's gonna focus on a specific person anywhere and also blame is less likely to be attributed um, and the team gets a clearer perspective on how to win. Here's the good news and why I shared that. There's no stars here. There's no famous superstar anybody. Uh, We're just a group of people following Jesus, doing our best to see the gospel spread in our area. Uh, But sometimes all of us fall into this trap of thinking that what makes or breaks a healthy church is having successful staff or, you know, it's the staff's job to do this or that. Well, it's really not. It's actually what makes or breaks a healthy and growing church is actually when we operate as a team. And so I got to ask you a question. What is your role on Team Jesus here? Uh, Because everybody has a ministry. You know, and unfortunately, too many of us are too comfortable. Um, and, and, and if you don't know what your role is in ministry, I just want to encourage you to try something. Fail. What, what's the worst that could happen? <laughs> you probably won't fail. You'll actually probably succeed. Uh, it's going to be something you'll feel equipped along the way. Uh, but maybe life has become all about your time, your talent, and your treasures. And today is a reminder to reorient your life towards ministry. Now, I want to be crystal clear that in life, our primary ministry is always our family first. Um, And that the four walls of the home, that's the most important thing that God wants us to establish and set up. I think next to that, uh, your life in in ministry is your life out in the world and and the people that you interact with, you know, your friends, your coworkers, your neighbors, your family, and, and all of that. And right under that is finding your niche in the kingdom of God in Jesus's church. The goal though is to be sent out in ministry. And if that's not happening in your faith, then there's been some stunted spiritual development. It's not just about people on a stage. Everyone has a ministry. Ephesians 2.10 says that we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God has prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Um, So the fourth thing that I would have you jot down uh, when you're welcomed into the ministry is this, you are never done doing good. So here's the best part of the story and also maybe the depressing part. After this amazing success, two great successes, they packed up, they moved on, and they went to a new place where they had to do it all over again. See, you would think Paul could kick up his feet and celebrate and rejoice, but no, he had to get up the next day and he had to do it again. And some of the towns where he would go and we're going to see he's going to get beat. He's going to get imprisoned. It is tough going. Ministry is like parenting. The job is never done. And while there is breath in our lungs, we are called to build the kingdom of God on earth. You know, everyone in this room is called to be a kingdom builder. Today, we often, or before church, if you ever get here, we have a little huddle in the back with our team. We kind of share some wins. We call it Team Connect, and we pray. And with all of our volunteers gathered today, I announced uh, that every one of our volunteers is being reassigned. Everyone's being different, uh, different terminology. And so I said, as you're no longer a volunteer, from now on, you're a kingdom builder. See, we've all been in environments where somebody asked you to help. It's like you're lending a hand, like you're doing them a favor. And, and again, yeah, we're serving and we're giving of our time. But as Pastor Aaron and I and our team here, we were praying about the culture that we want to set here for our church, that what we're doing and what I'm calling you to today in ministry is so much bigger than City Church. It's not even about City Church. We are about building God's kingdom on earth. Is that not what Jesus taught us to do and taught us to pray, uh, that we would seek first the kingdom of God and then everything else would happen? Um, and so my, my hope and my prayer... 
uh, is that increasingly City Church would become a place where we are known as that church that just is relentlessly focused on building the kingdom of God. And so anyone and everyone who serves in our ministry is a kingdom builder. First off, in your own heart, you're called to build the kingdom of God. Secondly, you're called to build the kingdom of God in your family. You're called to build the kingdom of God in your vocation, in your life. Uh, and, and, And fourthly, you are called to build the kingdom of God right here in City Church in some capacity. Everyone has a role to play in this church. And finally, we're all called to build the kingdom of God even unto the ends of the earth. You know, this is the journey of discipleship uh, that Jesus laid out for us. And so please correct me if you ever hear me from this point on, use the word volunteer. We don't have volunteers anymore. You're all getting a raise. You're kingdom builders. (laughs) And so I pray today that some people feel empowered to launch into their role as a kingdom builder. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, thank you for the reminder that we're here not for our glory or our purposes or our kingdom. We're here for yours. And and we're here because you sent your son Jesus to redeem us so that we could be given a new identity, reformed from the inside out, transformed, turned into a new person, God, so that now we can go and bless Uh, people in our lives that we can be ambassadors of the kingdom wherever we go. And I want to take an opportunity right now and talk to anyone in here who's not yet sure you would call yourself a Christian, that when you hear the word kingdom of God, you don't know if that's the kingdom that you're a part of. Well, I want to give you a chance to settle the question right now. Um, and, And if you were to pass away today, you are honestly not sure that you would walk across from the shores of earth to the shores of the kingdom of heaven. I believe God brought you here today to just settle any doubt about it. I often remind us that God promises to forgive us of our sin, to adopt us into his family, to fill us with his Holy Spirit and to give us an eternal life. And there's only one catch, Jesus wants our hearts. And so if that's you and you have been thinking about God, you've been thinking about the Bible, but you haven't stepped over the line. Friends, the Lord's calling you to his kingdom. He's calling you into his eternal purpose right here and now. So I'm gonna give you a chance to pray a prayer in your heart. The Lord will hear it. Um, Just pray this with me. Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for my sin and the sins of the world. I believe you died there. And I believe you rose from the grave so I could have everlasting life. Lord, come into my life. Forgive me of my sin. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and give me the power to live this life for you. God, I'm tired of running. Here's the steering wheel of my heart. Would you take over? Thank you for welcoming me into your kingdom. In Jesus' name, God's people say amen.